Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm so glad to see you all here this morning. I love to hear the sound of you visiting. It just warms my heart. If you're a guest with us today, you'll find a guest registration card, a welcome card in the pew rack in front of you. Please take it and fill it out. You may leave it on the pew beside you or as you exit the, the sanctuary this morning, there'll be uh, offering containers on the way out. Just slip it in there. Either way, it's just fine with us. Also, we, you can use the back. Anyone is welcome to use the back to put on a prayer request. We do review these and we pray over them at staff meeting and we can add them to the prayer list if you'd like. So um, just use this card to let us know what's going on in your lives. And now let us use this time to prepare our hearts for worship. scripture that calls us to worship today is Psalm 104, 1 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch your heavens out like a tent. You, you set the beams of your chambers on, on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for helping us through the tough times that COVID brought. Thank you for keeping us safe and keeping us and giving us hope. Please continue to help us stay safe. We look forward to worshiping you this morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing together hymn number 297, Here I Am to Worship. King 
of all days. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am. Here I am to worship. Good morning, friends. How are you doing today? It is so good to see you, and uh, good to see a lot of our folks have been traveling and are back in tow a little bit, and uh, especially good to have Lisa tucked away back on the back row back over there, actually behind the back row, in her VIP seating uh, there. It's good to have her with us. Uh, if you look in your, your bulletin, you know that she is supposed to be giving a, a testimony of, uh, of gratitude. And in fact, if you look up at the screen, that's what she's doing right there. About a week and a half ago, I took a little tumble walking these beautiful furry beasts and broke my ankle in several places and disconnected some bones. And Monday, I got the opportunity to get some plates and screws in there. And I just want to take this time to thank the church for all the love and prayers and the help. Um, walking the dogs and the meals and the um, food and the just visits and staying with me while Glenn works and just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts um, and this is what church being the church is all about and I'm just so proud to belong to a place such as this. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you for how much we praise your name. You know, all things are to the glory of you, and I know you'll bring good out of this too. Um, Lord, give us patience. Please help me not be so hard on Glenn. And Lord, just help us, help me get stronger and stronger every day. Lord, thank you for this beautiful place we call your church for these beautiful people. And we love you so much, all in your name, amen. Uh, let me take a moment. Uh to also just say a word about uh, the events of earlier this week. If you were here uh, or if you'd seen online, we were able to share kind of what's out in front of us. It's been a lot of questions and there's been a lot of things that we've been weighing as we go. How do we go forward? And uh, beginning uh, a week from this coming Sunday, we'll be back to a regular Sunday morning schedule, regular meeting in, in person Bible study on Sunday morning uh, in each of our groups. Uh, complete programming for preschoolers, children, youth, uh, and adults, and one united service at 1030. And if you look online, you can see the presentation, or if you just want to look through the uh, PowerPoint presentation, you, you can really can see the reasons we've chosen to do that, why we think that's the wise thing to do now, uh, but also where we see God leading us in the future, not just in terms of worship, but just in terms of 
all that we are as a church. So I'm excited about the days ahead. Uh, I am truly a believer that our best days are ahead of us, and we get to walk that road together. Uh, and the depth of that togetherness has been felt this week uh, in our family from Monday, uh, the day of Lisa's surgery, uh, and on, on beyond. So uh, thank you for loving on her and saying hi on the way in and out. And let me share a word of prayer with you this morning. Father, for the gift of Ecclesia, that wonderful word that we translate as church or congregation, assembly, people who have voluntarily said, we're doing life and faith together. We're going to love on each other. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to worship together. We're going to change the world together. Father, that was your plan all along. And to be able to share in it all these years later means the world. We thank you, Father, for the gift of being uh, folks who share that love. And this week, we give great thanks for the way that we have been recipients of it. Father, continue to walk with us in the days ahead. We desire more than anything in our hearts and souls to be the church that you want us to be. To grow uh, in, in terms of our faith, to grow in terms of our impact, to grow in terms of folks who are coming along with us in this journey. Uh, as we become a bigger church, let's become bigger people. And let us become a bigger impact on the community where you've placed us as we help your kingdom come. Father, for all this and more, we pray and we give thanks. And we do it in the strong, strong name of the one that has come, the light of the world, that's Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's continue in worship now as we sing Shine, Jesus, Shine. It's hymn number 156. Please stand.
as I share a missions moment with you today, um, I have a confession to make, and it's something fairly personal. See, since I was a very young child, I've always wanted to be in a dunking booth. <laughs> like, just to give it a try, just once. Uh, and that opportunity actually came this week, and that's uh, one of the events I wanted to share about with you today. Uh, you may have noticed in your midweek update this week some information about an event that Habitat for Humanity uh, put on this Saturday, yesterday. Uh, and it was done in conjunction with several other missions partners in our community as well. Uh, First Cumberland Presbyterian Church down the road, uh, Mur Murfreesboro Muslim Youth. Uh, I know that several folks had a, a, a booth there as well. Uh, the, uh, the organization Thrivent was there, and I even saw uh, Andy Womack. Our own Andy Womack was there with State Farm. And uh, a bunch of partners came together uh, to do something very special, and that was this. I had never seen this before. It was called a panel build, Okay. And there were, at any given time, 18 or 20 hammers going in the background, building, putting pieces of wood together to build sections of wall, right? And they'd build one little panel. We were in the parking lot, by the way, of, of Habitat for Humanity. We weren't on a, a house building site. We were in a parking lot. They were building sections of a wall. And then when they would finish one, a couple of big, strong guys would go carry it over to this side of the parking lot. And they'd finish another, and they'd, carry the, and they'd, they'd start to put them together over here. And as the morning and then the afternoon went on, all of a sudden, the floor plan of a house begins to... Uh, begins to appear in this side of the parking lot. They were building a house, folks, in, the, in a parking lot. I've never seen this before. With the intent to, once it's built and they know it's all going to work, to then disassemble the sections again, the panels, and then take it to the location where they're actually going to build the house uh, for the Desmond family who was there yesterday. It was an amazing event. I had never seen this event happen before. I felt like it was building a house Legos style, if you know what I mean. Uh, it, was, it was beautiful. I had the opportunity, was asked if I wanted to uh, contribute by sitting in the dunk tank, uh, and I happily said yes. It was a great experience. Uh, several of the children who are going to live in this house that was built yesterday, uh, had, I had the privilege of being dunked by them uh, multiple times, and they were just so happy, and honestly, so was I. Uh, it was a beautiful day, and I just want you to know that stuff like this goes on in our community. And you can always get involved. We do lots of missions through our church, but we are on mission wherever we go. And our community is a huge mission field. And I pray that we always remember that and we are thankful for those in our midst that participate in these. Uh, Derek, if you'll come now. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you this morning just thanking you for uh, another Sunday to just gather together as a body of believers and to worship you and to pray to you. Uh, Lord, we, we ask that you please bless these tithes and offerings uh, to your will. And Lord, please help us to be the light of the world and to, to do the one thing that sets us apart from the world and uh, to show love to others. Please help us show love to others throughout this week. And uh, we say all these things in your name. Amen.
Please join me in a time of prayer. God, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts because you are good in all you do. You are faithful in your promises, gracious in mercy, and abundant in grace. We are filled with all at, the, at all the ways that you have poured out your blessings in our lives, and we ask that you help us not take these blessings for granted. Give us eyes to see the needs around us, ears to hear the calls for help, feet to carry us swiftly to those in need, hands to serve them, and hearts full of compassion for the least of these, your children. God, we lift up to you those in our community who are in need of your presence, those who are sick or have received an unfavorable diagnosis, those who are grieving and those who feel lost in the darkness. Help us to be reflections of your light in their lives and be with them, surrounding them with your love and peace of mind and comfort during these difficult days. But we also want to celebrate with those who have received good news, a clean bill of health, or gone through successful surgeries and are on recovering well. We thank you for your providence in their lives and for those who have ministered to them in your name. And now, God, I ask that you will bless this time of worship. May it be pleasing and honoring to you as we bring you praise and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we couldn't let a Sunday sermon on darkness and light go by without singing the Hank Williams classic, I Saw the Light. If you know it and would like to, sing along whenever you want. I wandered so aimless, I filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man I wandered along, worries and fears I claimed for my own. And like the blind man that God gave back his sight, praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I 
saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness. No more night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow inside. Praise the Lord. I saw. y'all enjoy that and uh, thanks for the opportunity of sitting in having uh, Brian's dad with us on the banjo it's always good to have them in town in tow with us and uh, appreciate Brian putting all this good stuff together in the theme with our sermon today when I heard Brian talking about the uh, habitat and the dunking booth you know I wish we thought that sooner during the throes of COVID that could have provided for socially distanced contact free baptism you know, good ideas too late. Story of my life. It really is. Uh, love Habitat and what they do. Uh, of course, it's Origins down in southwest Georgia with Cornelia Farms and uh, the folks down there that uh, some of the leaders of that and influential in my own development years back. So uh, we are uh, grateful to support that. Lisa used to send me the Habitat bills on the odd chance that I might learn something. Uh, in which I've much needed to. And again, it's, uh, it's good to, to be together and to be in. Uh, we made it this morning. Lisa was here for the early service. I had flashbacks to getting kids ready for church when we had uh, that. But she has been a trooper. And uh, y'all just continue to hold her up, and I appreciate that so much. We're in the uh, final installment of our series on Caught Between Two Kingdoms. And we're talking about what it's like when we've got two things that have hold on us and they're pulling and we feel that tension between the two and understanding how we can respond, how we can live with that, how we can make the right choices, uh, how we can put those competing forces uh, in context and perspective. You know, we began with God and country standing between the American flags and the Christian flags on the 4th of July and talking about the tension. We're not the first country to ever deal with that. We're not the first religious group to ever struggle with our place within an earthly kingdom where there's been an unhealthy uh, coming together of that. We're not the first. That's part of history's story. We talked the week after that about heaven and earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we did, and we, we talked about that, we realized that when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're not just talking about the sweet by and by when we meet on that beautiful shore. But the idea that the kingdom of heaven should come on earth, that that's why Jesus came to bring that, his reign. As I like to say, he didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. He understood his life in terms of of rain, but it's a rain of love. Uh, it's a rain of light. And that we get to share in as his followers at making that happen. What a wonderful privilege. I mean, we get to help Jesus do his job and to share in that. It's a beautiful thing. Last week we talked about light, about uh, life and death. That there are forces that take life from us. But there's all also life giving. We live in those tensions. How do we live that out? Today, in our last installment, we're going to talk about light and darkness. Darkness and light. You know, that is the very oldest motif that we have in the Judeo-Christian heritage of understanding God's activity. Mothers, if you're out there, you can probably remember your kids' first words. You may have a family argument about whether it was mama or dada, okay? But how about God's first words? The first words that we have of God in Genesis 1, 3. Let there be 
light. That's his first thing he said. And now the power of that, he spoke life into the darkness. He stood out, as that great poet James Weldon Johnson said, on the face of the deep, darker than a thousand midnights down in a cypress swamp. And he spoke light into the darkness. And we also know that that was his first act of creation. The first way that we know God is as a creative light bringer and builder. And throughout the history of the Bible, we've seen light physically show up in manifestations that uh, the mirror his activity, the sign that God is up to something in that moment. You know, it, it was the, the light that shined behind the clouds after Noah uh, landed that boat and God put the rainbow in the clouds. We saw that prism. It was a light from a burning bush that called Moses to go down into Egypt land and say, let my people go. It was a light of the pillar of fire that led the people of Israel through the wilderness on their sojourn to the promised land. Tongues of fire at Pentecost, the bright light that came out of nowhere that blinded Paul and somehow took away his sight, but also gave him sight at the same time. You see, light into darkness is what God has always been up to. It was his first word, but it was also he gets the last word. In Revelation 22, we hear the words of John the Revelator who says, There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever. There you have it. Three verses into the Bible and about 20 verses before it quits, we get God speaking of light overcoming darkness. Now, if we've been around the church long, you know your Bible a little bit, you know that there's a, a ton of passages that speak about that. And they tend to show up for us uh, during seasons of the year. One of those is during the season of Advent. The season of Advent where we celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. And part of our ritual with that is that we have Advent wreath and we light the candles. We light candles uh, for love, joy, peace, and hope. And then the Christ candle that gets lit uh, on, on the, as we come together on that Christmas Eve. And I don't know what the practice is here. We'll find out in a few months when we finally get to do this together. But I know I've always loved as the pastor coming and taking a candle and lighting my candle from the Christ candle. And then giving it to some of my deacons and some of the ushers around and then to spread throughout the room where everybody's got a candle. Everybody loves it except the custodian that has to clean up the wax. And then suddenly the light is as bright as day. On a Christmas Eve, and it all started with one little flicker from the Christ candle, which is the perfect image of coming into this world that the light can shine. We also hear that during the season that we don't talk as much about in the Christian calendar, and that is the season of Epiphany, which comes after Advent. And Epiphany, the word literally means revelation, a new understanding. And it's since as part of the worship calendar, it means a manifestation or a recognition of Jesus' coming into this earth. Advent, we're waiting on it, we're waiting on it. And then in, in Epiphany, it's here. And we not only know what it looks like, we're discovering what it means. And that's what we've been doing ever since. So in the spirit of those two things, anticipating a coming, and in seeing God take action, and then recognizing and responding to that coming of light, it gets us to the text that we want to run to today. Now I want to start by going back to an Advent text in Isaiah. Uh, in the first part of Isaiah, you know, if you know much about that, Isaiah is kind of divided in sections. You get the first 39 chapters, and it's a lot of woe is me, a lot, a lot of judgment and gloom and doom. It's pretty dark reading, to be honest with you. But tucked away in the middle of that in verse 9, in chapter 9, is some of the most familiar passages in all of our, our faith. 
We know the, the Christmas passage, passage that says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. But it's preceded by this passage. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And to those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and, and as men rejoice when dividing plunder uh, for the day of Midian's defeat. And it goes on from there to talk about uh, on two levels. One of those levels is the nations of Naphtali uh, and Zebulun, parts of the tribes of Israel, that are living in captivity in the darkest conditions you can imagine. You know, j just imagine uh, a land where things, there's just no hope. Uh, it's dark, you're separated from what you love. It's just a bad, bad situation. And he's talking about the, the, uh, the people in that area, uh, out of Galilee of the Gentiles, that they're going to see a great light. And that light came with the, the defeat of, uh, of the, uh, the Midian army uh, and the returning uh, from captivity. But it also is a messianic passage that tells us of the coming of Christ some 700 plus years later. That's why we get, for unto you a child is born. That's where we get the wonderful names of Jesus. He shall be called. And so our New Testament passage this morning on light, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. And uh, Matthew is uniquely tied to the Old Testament and to the Hebrew faith and tying it together uh, in the Christian faith. That's his unique specialty and his unique slant in, in writing uh, his gospel. We get the beginning of the baptism of Jesus. We get the story in chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus. Get to verse 11. It says, the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him at the end of the temptation. And what we don't know is how long it is between verse 11, verse 12. Some scholars say it's as much as a year between those two verses. But then it picks up with action. You're waiting to see what happens after the baptism, after the temptation. Jesus begins to preach, and when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison... Heard about what had happened to his cousin, his forerunner. He returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake. I've been there. It's a, it's a really unusual place, beautiful place. By the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. You catch that? We got, we got Isaiah 9 happening in Matthew 4. Jesus goes up there so he can come back. And the, the, the scripture goes on further. He says this, uh, that was done to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. And then Matthew quotes him. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the shadow of death. Notice that imagery, the shadow of death from Psalm 23. A light has dawned. You see, Jesus went back to fulfill the prophecy. But what he was really doing was telling us this. He was telling us that when he was getting ready to bring light, he was going to go and do it in the darkest places. He was going to do it where darkness reigned supreme. He was going back to the places where people Living in darkness, we're in need of such light. And to understand that, above all, Jesus himself is that light that comes and speaks into the darkness. Now, you know, without light, a lot of bad things can happen. Um, one is that you can stumble. You can hurt yourself. I remember one time Lisa brought home a pumpkin at uh, Halloween time. We were in seminary. I would stay up and study late and then turn the lights off, come to bed and try to go in quietly so I wouldn't wake her up. And uh, she had put a pumpkin in the path I usually walked and I put my big toe right through that pumpkin. 
tore off my toenail. The only good thing is we did not have to debate where to put the nose of the pumpkin. It was, it was pretty clear where that was going to go. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're walking in darkness, you, you stumble a lot. It was part of the problem. It was dark when we were walking those dogs that night and a little wet. But, you know, some things happened. You know, Jesus is coming to say, I want you to be able to see where you're going. I want the, the, the warmth of my light to, to just come all over you. And I want you to be able to see things clearly. And he did. Because Jesus knew, as we do, that darkness is real. Darkness is real. Not just the kind of dark that happens about 8.30 this time of year. But the darkness of life coming over you. Have you ever been in a place where you say, you know, I'm just in a dark place right now? Just, just in a dark place. That comes with our emotions. Sometimes you know, it's just that events of life get too much or things happen and we just have a hard time seeing our way clear and we, we just have lost hope. It's funny, when we get anxious and we get hurt and we, we're in those dark places, our ability to see hope and to see options just goes way down. But Jesus has come that we might have light and see things more clearly and be able to walk forward into the future without fear, without that uncertainty. But you know, that kind of darkness is real on so many different levels. There's dark situations that people find themselves in life. Have you ever been in a toxic workplace? I mean, a place that's just, just not good to be in? We don't get to pick what families we get born into. We get that kind of hurt sometimes. Life comes at us hard. Darkness. Sometimes the darkness of evil that's imposed on us. What I like to call our sin against self. In this evil world, people hurt people. And they perpetuate that hurt. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, but it hurts. And it's dark. There's acts of pure evil. You can imagine some right now. And there are systems that uphold evil. And always have. Darkness is real. And that's why we need the light. The light of the world that has shined into the darkness. We just sang about it. We sang about it because we know that darkness is real and that there is an evil one who does not want our life to work. Doesn't want our churches to prosper. Doesn't want the kingdom to come. Glory is in destruction. And that's real. And so into that, Jesus comes. You know, there's an old hymn of our faith, the mighty fortress is our God. There's the verse that we uh, don't always sing as, as much or as, as well as familiar to us. When it says, uh, and still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His power and craft are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. And that is a lot of truth. There's not an equal in our ability in and of ourselves to overcome that. That's why Jesus needed to come. He came to give us that victory. We sing about that oftentimes, victory in Jesus. Victory over evil. That darkness that seeks to consume us. Now, I love the words of that, that hymn that's so beautifully written by Martin Luther and beautifully translated. I still don't know how they got the German to rhyme in English. I, I'll figure that out one day. But you know, a, a, a less you know, uh, beautiful and tactful way of saying it, I heard one time came from an old preacher back in the country that he was pastor and he had an old boy in his church and he just, he just stayed in trouble. You know, he was doing all kinds of things he knew he wasn't supposed to be doing, bad stuff coming out of it, and he just, it was just, he could just see what was happening. Finally, he took the old boy aside one day and he, he had a, a, a blackboard up there and he wrote on the front, he said, you know something, I'm going to tell you what the problem is. Go to preacher talk. He says, the problem is you've been listening to the devil. And he had the word devil written up there on there. And then he reached up with an eraser and he erased the D. And he says, and because of that, you've been consumed with evil. 
And he erased the E and he says, and because of that evil, you've been doing things that are vile. He erases the V and he says, and it's making you ill. And if you don't quit, he erased the I and he says, you're going to hell. They threw the crowd and laughed at that, y'all. They didn't get some other stuff, but they got that one. It's that sense of, yeah, that's a simple way of understanding what happens. There is one who does seek to work us woe. And on earth, it's not as equal. We can't fight in our own strength. The good news is we don't have to. We can't cast out darkness in our own light, own way. Remember the great words of Martin Luther King when he said, darkness cannot cast out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot cast out hate. Only love can do that. But we have the good news that throughout the scriptures, Jesus is continuing to tell us not just that he's the light of the world, but what that means and what that means to us. And in Matthew 5, uh, we get... We get to a part of the Sermon on the Mount where he says to us, you are the light of the world. And in John 1, 4, he says, the light that shines in the darkness, uh, and, and, the, and the darkness has not overcome it. That the ultimate victory is his. In John 3, we know the familiar verses of John 3, of uh, as we did the John 3, 16 passage, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. But three verses later, he says, light has come into the world, but men prefer darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, has not life taught you that? That there are some folks given the choice between light and dark will run towards dark every time. And we've all got that temptation. We've all got that within us. In John 8, Jesus comes very clear to say, I am the light of the world. And uh, in John 12, 46, he says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now, here's the the deal. We all wander into the darkness sometimes. We can do that. We all find ourselves on roads that aren't marked real clearly and we know can lead to destruction. You've heard me talk about it. If you, get on, if you stay on the road your own long enough, you're going to get where it's going. That's just part of life. That's true whether you're talking about I-24 or life in general. You get on a road, you're going to get where it's going. And, but he says you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay in darkness. There's always a way back into the light of his love. There's always a way back to minimizing a hurt that we do to ourselves and we can do to others. Because at the end of the day, we we don't want what darkness brings. To have that capacity to say, you know, I I want to have it be different. Jesus goes on a little further to talk about his people. He says, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. You know, if you think about what are God's people known for? You would hope that beyond us, we would be known as people of love, people of light. And I think in a large community, we are. But sometimes, we're not. There are some folks who have a hard time getting to Christ because of Christians. That's, we see that out there. I think one of my my favorite singers, my my very favorite voice is Mary Chapin Carpenter in, in country music. Who years ago wrote, I tuned in by remote, uh, in the dark one night, I tuned in by remote. I heard a preacher who spoke of the light, but there was brimstone in his throat. He'd show me the way according to him in exchange for my personal check. So I turned the channel back to CNN and I lit another cigarette. I'll take my chances. That's the way a lot of folks feel. Forgiveness doesn't come with a debt, she sang. You know, the idea of that we're angry people does not help. The idea that we are known more for what we're against than what we're for doesn't help. The gospel is a gospel of yes. I hope we know that. God has a favorite word, and it's yes, not no. To know that, uh, that he loves us with all his heart, and that love flows to us because we need it. 
and from us because we get to share it. That light comes in so that we, it can light our way, but then we can be the light for others. But sometimes our motives get in the way. Sometimes our lesser selves come through. I always remember uh, years ago, Lisa and I were in Hawaii. We were out on a boat with a Hawaiian guide and just listening. I like to listen and learn in different cultures, especially when you get to go to Hawaii. That's, that's a good place. That's a great classroom, I'm telling you. Um, <clears throat> and I remember him talking about the missionaries, his view. He said, uh, yeah, the missionaries came here to do good, and they did well. They took our land. They did well. I imagine they have a harder time thinking about light because of even well-intended folks, darkness. You see, those kind of things may not be our response. We may not be responsible for those things, but it is our responsibility to understand where people of faith and, 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 a, and sometimes in God's name have done unspeakable things. And that's why when God sent his son, and his son began preaching that the first words of his preaching was this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's that idea that he's come to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, but he can't do it just proclaiming it. It has to be embraced. It has to be received. We need an advent and an epiphany. We need the understanding that he's come, but we also need the realization of what that means and let that light live in us and shine through us and see that and live life accordingly. The light's always there, but it's not always easy to see. And that brings us back to the song we got to sing this morning. I thank Brian for letting me sit in with that. I... uh, I love rootsy music, and that mandolin I got to play, my grandfather died in 1938. He left one thing in this world. That was it. And so I get to put my hands on that and remember my heritage. Uh, And on top of that, it's a really good sound of mandolin. It makes even my poor playing sound decent. Um, But Hank Williams, do you all know the story of the song, I Saw the Light? Let me tell it to you. You all knew that Hank wrestle with demons. It, it came through every fiber of his music. You can't hear I'm so lonesome I can cry. I could cry and not, not know just the depth of that. He, he was, Ken Burns called him the Shakespeare of the people. Uh, you know, he, he just could distill all that hurt and all that pain and, and let it come out. And for him, it, it went into alcohol, it went into drugs, it went into different behaviors and things that were dark, led him to dark places. So much so that it was just a routine that he would be completely wasted before, during, and after his shows, and he'd sleep it off on the way home in the back seat of a car. And it was usually his mama that would ride in the front seat. And it was, his, it was her job to turn around and rouse him and begin waking him up when they got near home. Well, her landmark for that in Montgomery was the old Danley Airport. They had a light shining up there. And she turned around one time, she was coming out of his stupor, and she shook him and said, Hank, we're almost home, I can see the light. And then that gave way to writing the song, I saw the light, I saw the light. There's a myth of country music that he set up in his seat and wrote the song right there in the car. Uh, Country historians say that if everybody who said they were with him when he set up and wrote that song in the car was with him, he would have needed a 20-passenger bus. Uh, Everybody wants a piece of that story. Wake up. We're almost home. I can see the light. But there's another story a few years later in San Diego too drunk to go on, just eaten up with his own demons. Minnie Pearl puts him in a car and starts riding him around town. Rides him around and tries to get him sober enough to to go back on. 
And she starts singing. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Hank rose up and said, Minnie, that's the trouble. I never saw the light. I just never saw the light. When he died, 20,000 people came to his funeral in Montgomery. They stood outside the Civic Hall with amplifiers to overflow outdoor spaces. Roy Acuff sang over his coffin, I saw the light. Little Jimmy Dickens was supposed to sing along. He was too overcome with his grief and his tears to be able to even raise a voice. But 20,000 people heard that song and the testimony that the light was there. It just never had the epiphany. I thank God for light that shines even in the most unreceptive places. And we've all been in those dark places. And we know folks who are and have been. But the good news is the light is there. It's there to be seen. The light that any time God shows up with his light, as he, as he did that, it was always the sign that he was acting breaking into history on our behalf to bring hope, to bring hope, to bring light into darkness. And you know, that's what God does best. He shows up and he is at our be his best when we are at our worst. That's what I love about God. It's just like him to do that. It's just like him to be able to give us the opportunity at the times of grief and hurt to bring some warmth and light into that. It's just like him to help us understand the darkness that has impacted our lives along the way in one way or another and how we can be the ones to break the pattern and say it stops here. It's just like him to saddle people right up close to us who've walked those same roads. It says, I, I know where the light shines, how we can see our way back. It's a God who looks at the world that he created and realizes there's a lot here he's not happy about. But he keeps shining that light because he never gives up hope that it's going to be seen. And it's going to do its job. And it's going to reflect off of his people onto the world and make it a lighter place. That's why the theme of light shows up so much through the New Testament. That's why we need it so badly. And the world around us needs it so badly. I could ramble a long time about things that just ramble in my head and my soul over this. But I do know this, that the world we're in needs light. It doesn't need more darkness. And that as carriers of the light, we don't need to be an echo of the world that we live in. We need to provide an alternative. And the alternative is Jesus. And that's the best news. It always has been and it always will be. May we see the light and be the light. Let's pray together. Lord, we just can't get over the very fact from the very first act of creation. You're trying to help us see you clearly for who you are. And you're trying to give us a gift of your grace. We need it now more than ever. There's some of us, Lord, who need it personally in these very moments. To speak into darkness in our life and our hurt and our frustration. Our pain. And Lord, it's needed in this world. Because there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of stuff that's just not of you. 
Help us to combat it with love and light. Just like you did when you sent us your son. That's my hope, my prayer, and it's always my expectation. And I make it in the strong, strong name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. We're going to stand together and sing a hymn that I hope you will sing as a prayer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's a promise. Let's sing it. A poem, a prayer, and a promise all at the same time. Even before we started singing a cappella, I was thinking to myself, I love hearing these voices sing such a beautiful truth. What a joy to be together this morning. I love you. Appreciate you so much again for what all you've done for us. And uh, let's take the opportunity to be light everywhere we can, to be joy, peace, love in a world that's woefully short on all those things. We've got an abundance. Phil? Come and lead us as we're dismissed with this place. Sure. Thank you so much for being with us, both here and online. Let's bow now for our benediction. Lord God, you have given us so much. Your light, which shines daily in our lives. A community of faith to be a part of and journey with. And a hope for a future that nothing can take away. Grant that our church might continue to shine your light more and more brightly in this community. And as we leave this place today, help us to reflect your light to all those around us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen.